Today we are going to uh, kind of kickstart the OOP244 going through uh, uh, the main concepts of object orientation and what are we dealing with and kind of uh, try to understand what is the step that we are taking from C going to C++. Before doing that, any questions about anything down to this point? Any questions? One. Any questions, too? All right. So the very first thing that I want to uh, um, talk about is what I started last time. Like, we kind of started object orientation, talking about object orientation. Remember I told you, close your eyes, and I talked about the hello at night. And uh, remember that thing? That I, OK. So uh, going through those things, uh, you remember what are one of the three main aspects of object orientation that we are very proud of. You name one of them. Encapsulation. Encapsulation. And what is the next one? Uh, inheritance. Inheritance. Well, we have some good students today. And what is the next one? Three things that we know about object. Polymorphism. Polymorphism. Thank you very much. What is encapsulation? Well, encapsulation is. Encapsulation is when you get the microphone in front of you. And <laughs> you put the data and the instructions together. Behavior. Data and instructions together. So instructions, and the good thing is that instructions, behaviors, potatoes, potatoes, okay? So putting the data and behavior together was encapsulation. Remember what polymorphism was? If you, don't, if you don't recall, you simply say pass and give it to the next one or try your best. It's your choice. I just remind you of that. Yes, 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 yes. It's a different type of the same action. 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 So different. So uh, the like, and I and I and I cannot put more emphasis on that. I I asked these questions an hour and a half ago from OP three, four, five students, and nobody could answer. Like the the the, the questions that you answered right now, and these are key stuff that people when you want to hire you, they actually ask you. What is a polymorphism? You, you, there is a textbook answer to it. Okay, different types of the same action or doing the same thing in different ways. That's essentially polymorphism. When same action means differently based on the platform it's being applied to. As we mentioned, uh, you uh, fly an airplane, uh, you fly a kite. They're both flying, but in different ways, right? Okay. Remember what was the last thing? Inheritance. Inheritance and the inheritance meant what was inheritance? Do you remember that? It was that? like uh, reusing the code. Reusing the code. That's all we need to do. We are reusing our code. So how is it different with C? C is reusing the code with calling a function. Pass the, as soon as you answer, you pass the, pass the talking stick. So we said reusing the code. Essentially, as, uh, inheritance is how C++ reuses code. So how is it different? with reusing code in C? Do you remember? That's a tough question. So you actually have to teach it now. <laughs> Do you remember? I'm not sure. OK, so C language reuses functions, which means you write a function, certain action, and that action is being reused over and over and over. If you're smart enough, you put all the related actions in one module, so it's organized. OK? And usually that module refers to one thing. They kind of uh, improve that in C++. So instead of a module, we call that a class. And we put the data on behavior inside a class. And reusing a class is essentially getting an old design and reuse that design to build a new class out of it. We said we have a motorcycle. What is, what is a motorcycle? A motorcycle is a bicycle. So whenever you hear is a, inheritance is involved. OK? All the time. All the time. I'm saying BMW is a car, which means BMW is a class of car that inherits all the aspects of a car. And a car is a vehicle. So therefore, BMW is a vehicle. And BMW is a car, right? Uh, something like that. So we call that inheritance. And we said we put these three things together, and we call that object orientation.
But there is one important aspect of programming we did not mention last time that we have to mention today is, is something that actually has nothing to do with object orientation, but everything to do with the skill of programming. And that thing is called abstraction. Okay? Anyone knows what is an abstract art? Do you know what's like the next person who has a talking stick? Do you know what is an abstract art? You can pass it to the next person. <laughs> you know what's an abstract? Anybody knows? Do you know what's an abstract art? I think so. Abstraction is like uh, putting all the same things together. That's classification. Like I'm saying, all the students are in one place. It's not abstraction. You classify things. Simplification. Kind of right, actually. Mm. Uh, well, what is, from all the artistic people of the class, what is abstraction? That's not the art, but thank you. That's abstraction with, 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 com with computer science. You take what you want, you ignore whatever. Does anybody care that I'm bald? No, because you don't need to know if I'm teaching or not, right? That's what you need to know. You take what you want. If you care if I can salsa? No, because we're not going to go to dance. We're going to do C++. What you're interested about me as a teacher is to teach. Unless I'm teaching salsa, then that's a different story. But what I'm saying is that abstraction is just that. Without abstraction, you get lost in your own thoughts. We as human beings always are doing abstraction. That's what we do. We have a goal on, so I want to take a bus. I'm just going to go to the bus stop and find out how do I get the bus, get the schedule, do all the things that are related to getting a bus and nothing else. I'm not going to do it. And people who uh, wander around, and they, they don't usually accomplish much because they are all distracted with different things. So essentially abstraction, it means remove all the distractions and remove all the distractions and put your cell phones to do not disturb. <laughs> yeah, where is it? There we go. So yeah, so uh, uh, remove all the distractions and only focus on what you are doing. So abstraction is essentially that. That's how you program. Your program focuses. Now, what's the difference between general AI and general AI doesn't have abstraction. It works on everything. It's general, of course. Right? That's a completely different thing. We have to start from here to get there. You have to start on little things and then go to. So, even that has abstraction when you think about it. They are using AI to drive cars now. Right? There are cars that they're driving, they drive themselves. These cars are using AI to drive. Can you ask them how fast a cheetah runs? No, they don't know. That. It's not related. Their abstraction is their focus is to drive, and they use the intelligence for that. So that's what it is. Again, to accomplish something properly, you need to have abstract. We're clear on that, right? So if I told you what is a good, um, oh, and, and there's one more thing that I have to tell you. It's called synergy. Uh, anybody knows what is the meaning of? Synergy, you know what's the meaning of synergy? It says this thing has synergy. You know what does it mean? I think it's how well do things work together. Together. Thank you. Wow. I'm getting very good feedback today. So how well things work together. Okay? So if I write a program, if I have a code that it has polymorphism somewhere, it uses inheritance somewhere else, it uses extraction somewhere, that's not an object oriented. An object oriented program is a program that is using these three things together with synergy. So they work together. If these things are not intertwined, then that's not an object oriented program. And obviously, abstraction is the most important part of the thing. So when you design a class, you actually look at the entity and see which parts of the entity you 
want to focus on, and that's, ladies and gentlemen, object orientation. We're going to have some little examples today on it. Now, C is mother of C++. We could say with almost full confidence that C++ is a superset of C, which means everything you have done in C works in C++. That's not 100%. Like the fraction of C++, it cannot work in C because of certain aspect of safety that is added to C++. And it's getting added every day as we are going further, C++ 20, C++ 22. As we are going further in versions of C++, this safety is being added more and more. What is the safety? This is type safety. What is type safety? Type safety is when C language, you set a variable, you can simply set one variable to another type of variable. It doesn't whine as much. It, it just, just runs. Most of us, it gives you a warning. Okay? Like, in literally, in C language, you can create a pointer, and you can put an integer inside the pointer. And the pointer casts it automatically. It says, so the integer you are saying is, you mean an address, so I'll convert it to an address. It won't warn you. In C++, you can't do that. C++ says, and it gets better and better, and it gives you tools to do that. So when you are putting one thing into another, or setting one thing into another, or you're passing something through a medium, either they have to be compatible, or they should be convertible. Otherwise, it won't allow you to do that. And this is called type C, what is added. They want, C was wild. You could do anything in it, anything. Okay, C++ came out earlier, was the object-oriented version of WILD. You could do anything you wanted, object-oriented. Now, they are trying to make the type safety more and more, so we shoot ourselves in the foot less. Okay? And that's one of the things that they always had with C++. C++, they would say, oh yeah, C++ uh, is not a good language because you make lots of mistakes and mistakes cost. But to forget about hundreds and hundreds of hours that the program works before it goes to trouble, hundreds of times faster than other things. Okay, C++ runs in everything, everything, every single thing that you look at right now, somehow it's in there, okay? So it's not something, uh, it's something that could, uh, be replaced by another language after certain fact, but the old ones will never go away. So don't think that what you're doing is useless, okay? Uh, I haven't seen anything like, they claim, oh, Java is a good, it's, not, it's a joke, you cannot even compare it to. One is for, uh, again, abstraction. Java is for one purpose, C++ is one purpose. The fact that they, 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 like C language has that very nice syntax, a syntax that everybody could write programs short and sweet and understandable. So they started getting it. Every new language that comes that wants to say something nice, they copy syntax of C. C++ came is the same. JavaScript the same. Java is the same. C sharp is the same. So they use the same syntax, but it doesn't mean they are the same language. The purpose of them are completely different. Okay. Um, um, to give you why, like for example, we have dynamic memory allocation in C++, which essentially you t uh, allocate memory instead of um, instead of just creating a variable. You tell to the compiler, "I'm going to take care of the space of the variable." Why do you do that? Because say you want to do some work with few numbers but you don't know how many they are until the program is actually is run by user. What are you going to do? Like, like, what is the size of that array that you want to choose? Think about it for a second. Or I give you a very simple, easy task. One statement for a program that you think you can write with C. I'm going to say, write a program that receives few integers and prints it in reverse. Sounds very simple, right? You have it in your uh, workshop too, I think. You can't do that. It's impossible. In C, you can't do that. 
Because he would say, how many integers? I would say, I don't know. So he said, OK, so I'll put an array of 20. I would say, I don't know, maybe it's 25. So I put 40, maybe it's 400. I put 400, maybe it's 5 trillion. How do you know? When you don't know how many things are coming in, how can you create a variable for it? For that, what we do, we create an array, but an array without a body. So it only creates an array with the name of the array, but it doesn't have a body. So we don't know how many. And we ask the user, how many integers? User says 32. Then, while the program is running, it's not. You write the code, and you ask the operating system, give me 32 integers. And you make the array to be that 32 integers. Because you created it, at the end, you have to say, OK, I'm done. You give it back to the. This is this action of renting out memory from the, from the, uh, from the operating system to do stuff on the fly while the program is running. And when the program finishes and giving it back, it's called dynamic memory allocation. The good thing about it is that your executable becomes very small. You know every single variable that you create, it's something that is engraved into your, C, into your executable. If you have an array of 100 integers, you compile your code, and then you create an array of 1,000 integers. You compile your code, you will see that your executable grows by 900 integers, becomes bigger. Because the array is inside your executable, inside your code. With dynamic memory, it's not like that. You have only one little head of the array inside the thing that is always the same. The size of the array is decided when the program is running. <coughs> because of this, it's fast. But the problem is that people forget to give it back. People borrow it from the operating system, they run the program, and at the end, they forget to give it back. What happens? Every time the program runs, it borrows memory, but it doesn't give it back. It borrows and doesn't give it back. So the memory of your computer becomes the unoccupied memory of your computer becomes lower and lower as the program is running because it keeps forgetting to give it back. It just remains in memory unused. Operating system thinks it's being used still, so it doesn't touch it. And then after a while, you see your internet connection is not working anymore. You call Rogers, they say, unplug the modem, wait for five minutes and put it back in. Why? You're, you're literally rebooting. So all the memory and stuff got to go away, and then you start again. And after a month, again, that's called memory leak. Okay? Because of this, they were worried. Like they said, C++ is doing stuff like this. It's not a safe program, safe language. It, it crashes. It's difficult to do stuff. They created Java. Java doesn't have that one. Java, you can do dynamic memory allocation. You don't delete anything. It has its own mechanism. Every now and then, it's like you're calling the, the, the custodian crew to come in and clean up. Every now and then it calls the people and comes and cleans it up. So what happens, you don't have memory leak anymore. Good, right? The problem is that you're writing a game, and the characters are running in the game, right? Suddenly Java decides to clean up the memory. You see, it paused, and then run. <laughs> because you'd have no control of when is it going to happen, so it's not an efficient thing to do. Okay? So all I'm saying, the whole point of this thing is that, don't get stuck to one programming language. Learn the logic, understand the logic, see how you're supposed to program, then choose the proper one. Use abstraction even when you want to choose the language to work with. If you are working on a web page, JavaScript is your friend. It's dumb to write C++. You know how difficult that's going to be. So select the proper language. But learn one, the first one that you have properly. And because you are learning C++, it's like mother of all languages that are coming out, right? Anytime anything else comes through, you say, oh, that's easier. Like, I mean, like, it's as if you are going to the gym, you're lifting 40 kilo dumbbells. And if somebody gives you a shopping bag that is 5 kilo, you literally pass it, carry it around, right? Because you are practicing. This is what we are doing here. Are we good? All right. Type safety. Add it so problems like this happens less and less. Now, I'm getting into code now. And I have to explain a few things to you. Um, they are trying to, because it's an object-oriented language, we do lots of designs. And because of this abstraction that I told you, same thing can 
same entity can mean a different with a, with different aspects of the uh, different aspects of your program. Let's put it this way: We are at Seneca College. Uh, we still have OSAP, right? You know what OSAP is, right? So, OSAP. I'm, I'm old. Last time that I actually applied was it 26 years ago, so I didn't know if, it's, if the name has changed or not. So, so we have OSAP. Yeah, we have an OSAP department that gives loans to students so they can. And we have an educational place, right? Now, people who are programming for the education thing, if they want to deal with students, they need to create a student class, correct? So when they are actually coding, the education department creates a class student. So we have a, a class student. And the education department says, a student have a student number. A student, um, I'm going to follow the regulations for right from the beginning. So all the variables that are inside the class, you started with an M underline. Why? Because I'm the boss. OK, if you go work for Google, maybe the thing is different. But each place that you go, they have, a cert they have certain rules and regulations for variable naming, uh, uh, style of programming that you have to follow. Any, any variable you create inside the structure, you have to put an M underline in front of it. Why? To emphasize that this is a member variable, not just a regular one. It belongs to something. So student number and uh, it has uh, the uh, student has a name, 40 characters, and uh, student has a GPA. So that's what the education department is interested in. What is your GPA, right? That's the abstraction that I have for a certain problem that I have for the education problem, correct? Now, the OSAP department wants to come and deal with the student. What are they going to do? They're going to create. They have to create. What should they call this, uh, this thing? So education department created the student. Now, the OSAP department want to create a, what do you want to call it? You are working at OSAP department. And they say students come and they get loans. What do you call that entity? It's not a student loan. Student loan is the money. You're dealing with a person who's loaning money. Can you loan to me? No, I have to be a student. So they should name it a student. How? I already have a student. This is not polymorphism. Polymorphism was action. Remember that? Action can be the same, same name with different way. You cannot have two entities with the same name. That doesn't make sense. So essentially, if they could create it with the same name, the the OSAP department should have created a student structure, probably a social insurance number with a SIN number, and probably name too. Yeah, sure, why not? And put their name over there is 51 for some reason. And they have a double uh, uh, debt or money, whatever, or balance. What is the balance of this? So, so the abstraction of a student for the USAP department is the second one. Are we okay with this? That caused trouble. They said, wait a minute. We can't do this. Let's create some kind of a scope. First of all, remember what a scope was? Who has the microphone? Okay, what is a scope? Do you remember? Pass. Scope? Remember what a scope was? When we say it's scope, what did we mean? It's IPC. Scope, pass. If you don't know what's a scope, pass it. What is a scope? Do you remember? Whether the uh, variable is accessible throughout the program or? Bingo. Where a variable is visible. So if I have a function, I create a variable inside the function, the variable is visible inside the function, correct? That's the scope of the variable, the function. So we call it, it has a function scope. If you write an if statement, you open a curly bracket, you create a variable inside a curly bracket of the if statement, then it's only visible and alive 
in that first block of if, as soon as that is gone, the variable is gone. If you create the variable inside the function, it is visible inside the function. If you create it outside of the thing, it's visible outside, right? So the problem of the student over here is that they are in the same scope. That's why there's a conflict. How can I create scopes without anything else? I don't want any logic. I want a place that I can name things in it. I want a space to create names in it within a scope. What should we call it? We call it namespace. So what they did, they said, hey, education department, you are writing your code in the EDU namespace. So all the people in education department, and this could be in separate modules, it doesn't matter. All the people in education department, they write their code in namespace EDU. And all the programmers in the OSAP department, they write their uh, code in OSAP department, in OSAP namespace. So now what happens? This becomes a student of OSAP, this becomes a student of EDU, no more conflict. That's how namespaces were introduced to C. We didn't have it in C++. I'm that old. We didn't have this in C++. When they brought the namespace in, they said, wait a minute. Now everything has to go into namespaces, right? So what do we do with all the stuff that comes standard in C++? They said, no problem. We create a namespace called, namespace called STD. And everything that comes standard with C++, we put it in that namespace. That's why at the top of every single program that you see, you see because you don't want to use the namespace over and over, you write using namespace std. So you're essentially telling to the compiler, hey, if you see a name and you cannot find it, go look in the namespace std if you see if you can find it. That's what you do. Now, let's see how namespaces are syntaxed. So assume that these are in separate modules and I'm compiling them together. It doesn't make any difference. Namespaces, unlike classes, when they collide, they merge and create a bigger bubble. When you have two classes with the same name, there's a conflict. But for namespaces, when you have two namespaces with the same name, they just merge. It's as simple as that. And because namespaces are done within one department of the, of the company, it is impossible in the same namespace of EDU, I have two different students. That's not going to happen because the abstraction of the education department is education. They all work under that scope. Are we okay with this? Now, how does the syntax work? When you write a namespace, so remember from now on, because we are at Seneca, just to practice this, all the code you are writing, no matter what, is going to be under the namespace Seneca. You write the namespace in your header files, you write the namespace. So an empty file for you, will be this. So if I want to create a class for a student, uh, uh, if I want to create a class for a student, this is what I have to do. I'm going to say add. Let's, let's do something else. A student, what should I do? I'm going to call it subject. Let's say because I don't want to interfere with this student. Let's say I want to create a, a uh, a class to hold the information of a subject, like OP244, and, okay? If I want to do that, what do I do? This is what you do. You create a header file for it first. That's how you create a module. You say add item, so you call that one subject.h, that's the header file, and then you create another one. You call it subject.cpp, okay? Then you add safeguards. You have done this in IPC 144. You add safeguards to your header file to make sure it's only compiled once. It's not going to get compiled twice by mistake. So what you do, you create safeguards for it. We have a rule. Again, every company has its own rule. We have our own rule. Our safeguard in a header file is done like this. And you have to be able to, like at 3 o'clock in the morning, I wake up, wake up, wake up. 
write a safeguard for this header file. You should be able to do it with your eyes closed. It's like that. It should go into your DNA, OK? So when you get a header file, immediately write the name of the header file and replace the dot with a dash, immediately, OK? So what do we do? I have subject H. You write it all capital, subject H, right? Subject H. Which namespace we have to be in? Seneca. So you add that one at the beginning. This is something unique that you have to create for our everything. So Seneca underline. You, you see this? That if the, if the header file was heha.h, it would have been Seneca heha h. Got it? Are we all okay with this? Then you write these things before and after. So you write over here, if defined, if not defined, you write this, you copy it, and you change the second one with define, and at the end you write end if. Done. That's safeguard. How it works, we don't care. Memorize it. But that's what you do. You, when I tell you a header file, that's an empty header file. Create a, so that's going to be in your quiz with programming. I'm going to say create a header file for uh, a, a module called car. That's enough information. It means you're going to say the name is car.h for the header file. And I'm going to write, if not define Seneca underline car underline h, define Seneca underline car underline h, and if that's my header file. But it's a lie. That's not the empty one. An empty one needs an additional thing. What is that? I said you are writing all your code in what? Seneca namespace. So the second thing that you're adding is this. And this you should memorize. Namespace Seneca. Now you have an empty header file. So as soon as you want to write something, poof, you write this, then you start thinking, what am I supposed to do now? OK? So this is the fault of everything. Now, what do we do for the, you're really taking a picture? I'm recording this. Anyways, <laughs> so, so, so we're going to go to subject.cpp. In here, immediately you say include subject.h. And you add a namespace. And that's your empty CPP module. Now you start coding. OK? That's how, how a module is written. All right? Going back to the namespace syntax. OK? So this is how the namespaces are created in reality. And throughout the whole semester, you are doing that. So any code you are writing will have this in it. And any main you are writing is using it. It doesn't create any code, anything. So when I'm writing a, a main for my student, a main program that is supposed to deal with the student, this is what's going to have. So in here, I'm going to say add new item. I'm going to call, sorry, uh, subject. So I'm going to call it uh, su subject main.cpp. So your main will look like this, include subject.h using namespace Seneca int main. And that's an empty main for a module. Main uses the namespace you are creating. Are we OK with this? And that's. No exception. You got to use, and when I'm telling you, you have to do it with your eyes closed. That's I literally what, what I mean. You need to do this. Get, what, practice it, okay? So if I told you, and by the way, this subject main, okay, we call it a unit test. Because usually you don't have a subject. Subject is a class of a big application called, for example, I don't know, um, registration. Registration issues subjects for, 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 for students, right? So when you are writing a module, you have to write a test main and test it to see if it works properly or not, right? That becomes a unit test for, actually, I should have written subject unit test, whatever. But you know what it is, OK? So the main uses namespace. The modules are created inside the namespace, OK? Now, obviously, if I want to. Obviously, if I want to use standard stuff from 
C++, I can go over here, include IO stream, and obviously I'm going to be using namespace std. Are we okay? So again, we are not coding. I'm just telling you what you should do to prepare for coding. Okay? Anything that we have in our custom header for us goes in double code, and that's what it is. And remember an extremely important thing. You are never, ever allowed to use a namespace inside a header file, ever. Okay? So you cannot have using namespace inside subject.h. Compiler won't give you a syntax. The problem is that any poor person that includes your subject is going to start using that namespace without knowing it. And it may cause conflict. Okay? Let's go back to the syntax of the namespace. So that's the empty stuff that we created. Now, what is the syntax of namespace? I'm going to go back to here. So, in main, let's say I want to create an instance of the subject, of, of the student. Can I say over here, oh, can I say student S? No, it does not recognize it. It doesn't know what is a student, what the heck you're talking about. Okay? Now, in here, if I say using, I'm going to write it up here, using namespace, say OSAP, then this student becomes an OSAP student. If I bring the mouse over here, you, if I bring the mouse over here, it becomes an OSAP student with all its properties. Are we okay? If I write over here using education, now this is not a student anymore. It's, a, it's an EDU student. You see that? Are we okay with this? So what if I now want to use the OSAP one? What am I supposed to do? I'm stuck. What if I want to use both? I have, I have registration, and registration needs to know how many subjects you pass and, how, uh, and also how much loan you have. What am I supposed to do? That's where we qualify a name. What does it mean? Instead of writing student S, I can write over here. So this uh, student uh, S, uh, and in here I can actually write OSAP student OS, or, oh, yeah, mm, uh, OSAP, okay? So now O is an OSAP student, S is an EDU student. So now it is impossible for conflicts to happen. Are we okay with this? Yes. Yeah, and, and not write using namespace. Of course you can. Of, I, I, that's my next example. I'm going to actually show it to you. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> well, you're saying sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so what I'm saying is that, the, so the question was, can we just write, the reason I'm asking that because you don't have microphone, people who are listening to this, that they don't know what am I saying, of course, yes, you can. So the question was, uh, for the student at line 20, do I, uh, uh, can I write EDU scope, this is called, by the way, scope resolution, the scope resolution, it resolutes the scope, okay? So I'm saying scope resolution. Scope, can I say EDO scope resolution student? I would say, of course you can. If you don't want to put using, you can, you can just not put using. And just do EDU scope resolution student and OSAP and use them both without using any namespace. Using namespace is done when you have a lot to do with that namespace and you don't want to keep saying EDU project. If you don't want to keep doing that, then you want to use it. Usually the one that you're more involved with, you do using and for the rest, you resolute it with this resolution. Yes. Then you just qualify them both. But remember, so you qualify, you keep writing EDU in front of it. Okay? And and also remember. Let's let's uh, let's do like this. I'm gonna say over here struct 
loan, okay? And in this loan, I have integer sin, uh, integer, uh, sorry, uh, integer, uh, uh, I don't know, number, and I have double balance. And in here, instead of having that, I can have over here loan L, right? Are we okay with this? Any problem with that? Okay. And I can go over here in the EDU. I can write over here struct mark. And in here, I can say int value and int out of. Obviously, I'm a bad person because it's supposed to be m underline, and I did not do that. So in here, I'm going to say mark mgba. OK? Are we OK with this? Now, you answer to your question, OK? So. If I, if I right now do using for both, what's going to happen? That means this student becomes a conflict. You see that? Because it doesn't know which one. So I have to qualify that. So in here, I'm going to say edu. Right? Now there is no conflict, right? If I want to instantiate mark, however, I don't need to do anything. Because it's not something that has a conflict between the two. If I create a loan, I'm just fine. I can do that. I can actually create over here loan L. I can do that. If I look at this L over here, that's an OSAP. If I look at this one, that's for education. But student, because it's common between the two, I have to make sure that I uh, qualify it with the name of the namespace and the scope resolution. Are we OK? That's the whole thing. Nothing more about namespaces. Yes, sir. Resolution. There is no point. There is no point. OK, yes, you can just use that one. You can do that. But you will see what the point is later on. When you start typing and typing, and you have 900 things to write, and you have to keep writing, edu, scope position, edu, scope position, edu, scope position. Then you're going to say, now I know what the point is. I'm going to go up there and write a using namespace edu and get rid of all this damn thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, OK. No, no. No. <laughs> there is no point. It just makes your life easier. <laughs> Yes. For that, yes. Uh, so like in it's not automatic. It's it, because I'm saying using these two namespaces, loan only. So the question was, when I write loan, automatically it picks the one in the other namespace. There's nothing automatic. I am saying use both known namespaces. So this scope becomes can access now both namespaces because of using. And because mark and loan, they don't have any conflict, they are picked proper. Are we OK? Yes, madam. So, uh, oh, that's called scope resolution. It's called scope resolution operator. Scope resolution. So those two columns, back to back, they are called scope resolution. And they do exactly what they say. They resolve scopes. That's why it's called scope resolution. Are we good? All right. So now we know what namespaces are. Now we know what names. So in here, I'm going to call it. So in here, I'm going to say A namespace dot cpp. I change the names and I'm going to close them and go to the next one. So, so uh, 
let me see if I have something over here that's going to give me an error. No, this is empty. Empty, it's good. This is fine. Okay. And uh, we don't need this. Oh, if I have a main, I cannot do it. I have to remove it. I cannot have two mains, you know. Okay. So, next thing. I.O. In simple I.O. in C++. Okay. C++ does object-oriented input-output. If I'm lazy, I can do this. I can say include CSDDIO. It means I want to use the standard input-output from, from my mother, which is SDDIO. Of course, I'm going to say using namespace. If you don't say using namespace, you have to say STD scope resolution printf. You don't want to do that, right? So, so using namespace STD. Now in here, I'm going to say in main. And I'm going to say uh, printf hello op244 from IPC144. OK, and I go to new line. So that's, that's not an object theory. That's completely backwards thingy that we don't want to use. Works perfectly, right? Of course, if I use scanf, then it's going to cause trouble. Now if I write over here integer a, and I write over here printf um, enter an int. And you have done this already. Percent D. I will never, ever, ever want to hear call this thing ampersand. You will never call to it ampersand. I want to write over here, reading an A. You're not going to say ampersand A. You do that, I'll fail you. The name of that thing is address of. Address of. Address of. Never call it ampersand. Okay? Capisce? Are we okay? All right. So in here, we're going to say address of A. So scan an integer into address of A. If you don't say it right, you'll never learn it. That's as simple as it gets. Get an integer and put it into address of A. Ta-da. OK? But if I run this program now, I'm going to get, whoops, an error. Telling us what? Telling us, hey, you're, this is unsafe. Remember type safety? Because scanf passes the address of thing with a type that is not supposed to because it's coming from C. It's not safe. So you have to say, uh, all the uh, input output stuff, uh, please ignore them. And, and the reason you are getting this uh, error message is because you are using C++ compiler to uh, compile your, to compile your uh, uh, C program. And therefore, it gives you an error. If it was a C compiler, you didn't need to write that defined thing yet at the top. So if you write, G, if you write GC, is it GC, GC, what is the name of the code? CC? So if you write CC and you compile, you don't need that. If you write C++, then you have to add that one because it's type, type safety doesn't allow it. And yeah, so you do that, and now it actually reads it and compiles it properly. Are we good? All right. But that's I.O. that we had. You would be backwards compatible, right? And you don't write dot .h. Any like, you want to use standard library dot .h, you write csddlib. You want to write, you want to use string dot .h, you write c string. Okay? But again, you might need to add that defined statement. So you are saying, and <clears throat> you know what the hashtag is at the beginning. What does the hashtag do? Okay, you were saying? Yeah, what does it mean? Oh, that's a very fancy word. What does it do? Not what to include. What to? You're, you're good. You're good. Just keep going. Tells the compiler what to do. Okay, good. So you give, how about you? We, we call before the compilation begins. So you are writing two languages, not one. One is C language, the other one is preprocessor directives. 
is they are called preprocessed or directed. So you're telling to the compiler, compiler, before you compile, ignore all the warnings about CRT. Then go find out this file, copy the content, and paste it here. Literally. That's what include is. It copies a file, pastes it over here. Then when everything, when all the hashtags are done, it's all C, then the compiler begins to be to compile. We good? Okay. Time? Be good. I can show you an example for that in three seconds. Actually, let me do it right now. Uh, so this is. I'm going to say using C stuff in C++. OK? Now let's go back here. So so now I'm going to actually uh, write uh, a C++ code. And then I'm going to show you what include is. So in here, I'm going to say include IO stream. So now I'm saying I don't want to use standard input output anymore. I want to use uh, input output streams. What is input output stream? Input output streams are objects. OK? Objects that are representing output and input. The object representing output is called console out, C out. The uh, object that represents the keyboard is called console in, which is called C in. So you use that. Now, if you don't like to use namespace, you have to say C STD scope resolution C out, STD scope resolution C in. I'm going to tell that. Are you my student or are you a guest? So you're going to list hear that to the end of the semester. And if you come to 3, 4, 5, you're going to hear that. So, so, so now in here, I'm going to say C out. As you see in C out, I'm going to say C out. It means insert into C out this string. And then insert an end of line. OK? And I can actually do this. I can remove this. And I can say integer 244. And I can do Hence polymorphism. I'm going to say insert hello OOP244 to see how it's an operator, right? That operator is getting a C string, inserting it into C out. Therefore, it gets printed, right? That operator returns the C out back. Therefore, the outcome of this one will be another C out that receives a literal integer. Same operator that inserted. The string inserts the 244. 244 is printed. Returns a C out, receives another C string. Returns the C out, receives a, a, an integer uh, variable. Returns the C out, and it keeps going chain reaction. It's called cascading. Poof, everything goes out, and this is what you're going to get. Right? <clears throat> we OK with this? All right. <clears throat> And I can even do this. I can actually stop it right over here and do another C out over here. Doesn't make any difference. The outcome is exactly the same. If I run the program, it works the same way. No difference. We OK with this? All right? Now, how do I receive something? In here, I'm going to say integer age. Welcome, how old are you? Now you see I do this, and I'll <coughs> do that, and I'm not going to go end L. <clears throat> what is the difference between end L and backslash N? End L is an end of line. Backslash N is new line. End of line goes to new line, but the difference is that this 
flushes the output. Backslash n does it. What does it mean? On outputs that are buffered, like on matrix, if you just print a backslash n and you are in a loop, afterwards the program is busy, your message is not going to get printed. Because you ask the operating system, you ask the operating system to print it. But our present system has more important stuff doing to do in your loop. So it doesn't flush it on the output. You don't see any message over there. When the loop is over, and now, for example, you're asking for something, because the console is involved, operating system flushes the output. And L means stop now, do whatever you are, stop whatever you are doing now, and display this. So it's guaranteed that it's going to be shown on a screen. This doesn't guarantee that. So they are not the same. Don't think they are the same. And L flushes the output. Backslash N does it. So now in here, I'm going to say, <clears throat> from console input, extract an integer and put it in H. Ta-da. Now I'm going to say, see out. If H less than, I don't know, what is the youngest student that I had? I think, I think she was 14. I'm going to say over here, see out. Wow, too young to be in college. How do you write young? <laughs> to be in college. Uh, see how, take a seat. Okay, whatever, some garbage thing you have written, right? So if I run the program, how do I run the program? F10, pa. I want to debug it, see how it works. You press F10, it runs step by step. You have done this in IPC, hopefully. Okay, I press F10, it, it goes over here, it goes over here. Now IPC is created with 144 in it. It is initialized, age has garbage in it. Right? It comes over here, prints that one, CC, and then prints this one. So they're done. Okay? Now it's going to say welcome. Go to new line and wait for the age. Now CN is waiting for me to enter. I'm going to go 50 and I hit enter. Now age has 50 in it. Age is not less than that one. So it jumps to the next one and say take a seat and it goes out. We good? Right? Are we okay? One? Yes. No. Yes. You can do it in Xcode. Yeah. Use VMware. Okay. Yeah. I like, I, I like my comments like that. I like it to be like a prompt at the new, at the new line. It looks more beautiful. That's why I do it. Actually, I started doing that recently. I used to put it in front of it, but it goes indented, and I don't like it. Like, like this, it's always at the beginning. It's easier. Are we good? Namespace? All right. All right. <coughs> All right, so that's that. <coughs> uh, so, so let's save this. This is, uh, uh, oh. I want to say 35, and I hit enter. What did I enter? What was passed to the computer? <laughs> 35 and a new line. Three things went inside. OK? How many of them are integer? Three and five, right? So that backslash n will not be read. It sits in a keyboard waiting for the next thing to come. That's one of the thingy about console entry. Console entry always finishes with pressing the enter, so I want to pass the information in. But that enter is a backslash in of its own. That's why all the standard input C in, console input procedures, skip leading spaces. 
So the next one, when you have backslash n, when I say space, I mean white space. Space, backslash n, tab, form, feed, any white space character. They are skipped until a tangible thing is reached. That's why if I write an H and then afterwards write, a, I don't know, a number, it skips that backslash and that was in buffer and reads the next one and the backslash and st stays. If you read a single character after 35, you'll be in trouble. It skips it. It completely skips it as if it doesn't wait for it. So now if I actually write over here, that shows what the buffered input is. So in here, if I say, see out, enter a character, Oh, actually, I think this will work. We'll see. This will work. Single character, you still don't know how to do it. Let's see. Let's see if it works or not. This is the part that I told you after how many years of programming, I still don't know stuff. I don't know if it's going to work or not. OK? I don't know if it's going to show you what the example that I want to do. So if I say C in, and if I have over here character, I just want to see what is that, that character that I'm receiving. OK, so I'm going to run this. Now I'm going to say uh, 35, and I hit Enter. Now it actually waits. Good. So C in with the operator, extraction operator, always, always, always skips all the leading spaces and then starts reading. Just that operator. But if you know how to just read a single character, it will not wait. You're going to have a backslash in it. Okay, so, so remember that, you know, uh, remember, rem I switched to Farsi, uh, rem rem uh, remember this, okay, so now over here I'll go X and the X is going to be right, okay, we're good, now, are we okay with this, are we okay one, are we okay two, now take a look at this, I'm going to create a file, Add new item. I'm going to call it he dot who. OK? So I create a file called he dot who. And I'm going to create another file called boo dot boo. OK? Two files. Now I'm going to get this simple entry of mine. And I'm going to copy half of it in he who and then I'm gonna go copy the rest of it in boo boo are we okay with this now I'm gonna save this I'm gonna close these and I'm gonna go to the program now in here I'm gonna say Include he dot who include boo dot boo. And I'm gonna compile and run the program. I get an error. Why? And L on declare dot if I where am I? Which one was first? Oh, I forgot to put the <laughs> I forgot to put the thing. Give me a second. I forgot to put these two. <laughs> Actually I can I can do that too. Let me just do it, make it even fun. Add a new item. I'm going to say uh, what I missed. Dot txt. Add. Okay. So now in here I'm going to put that and close it. So I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to say include. Include, how did I, I did, did I, was it capitalized? What I missed, oh, got it, okay, so, what I missed dot txt. 
Done. So include is nothing but a copy and paste. Don't give it extra credit. As I told you, you're telling the compiler, go find this file, copy the content, paste it here. So all those things that I scattered everywhere, they get copied and pasted over here, and afterwards I have a working program. Okay? That's why we have a strict regulation how to write your header files. Not, you cannot just write anything. It's going to crash everything because it literally brings bad code into your code. Are we okay? Do we understand what preprocessor directives and includes are? Okay. And for example, you do define. You write a define statement and say, this, define this value to that, this thing to that. That's literally a search and replace. Compiler searches for that, replaces with what you have, and then uses it. And that's why we don't like it. You'll, soon you're going to see we're going to use something else. So that's that. Let me see what else. C, C++, procedural, hybrid, we wrote that. Yes. Pardon me? What do you think is going to happen? Huh? Oh, I, something that I have to tell, I have to talk about a, a special trick to give you walkthrough success all the time. Okay? If you want to do your walkthroughs properly like this, you, when you do a walkthrough, you must be dumb as a doorknob. Completely turn off your intelligence. Zero. And only bring the syntax in your mind. Follow the steps exactly as you see without expecting or guessing what's going to happen. Then you're going to get the correct walkthrough result 100% of the time. But as soon as you say, oh, I know, that means you screwed up. Turn your intelligence to off. Now, turn your intelligence to off. The first one includes the include and using namespace. The second one includes the first half. Now if you change the first half and the second half. Yes. So now we namespace? Have, no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, go. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. What's up? Okay. So now we, ha uh, we have these files now, files namespace. Mm. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, guys, 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 do we have a file called stdio? Yes, we do. There is a, those two thingies that you see tells to the compiler, go to your setup, see where your header files are. There's a directory in your compiler. All the header files are dumped there. Those two essentially means a specific path in the header file, in the header file directory of the compiler, and picks it up from there. They are just files, exactly like these, exactly like these. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, yeah, but just don't, because then it only runs on your compiler, nowhere else. Yeah, so that's not a, that's not a brilliant thing to do. I did that when I was a kid, and it, uh, yeah, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> uh, why can't I find my drives? Oh, this PC. Uh, C. Is it here? See, I'm such a such a bad person that I completely forgot where all the where all the Holy moly, forget it. I just wanted to see if I can find the includes and show it to you, but yeah. I don't know where it is, somewhere, trust me. <laughs> I used to open it up and show, but forget about it. It's there somewhere. All right, uh, questions? OK. Uh, sadly, I can't. It's something that is for, f it's com it comes from future. So let me tell you what happens. Um, uh, the computers used to be 
just one process, you and a computer. So when you printed something, it shows you on a screen. Now when you're printing, your computer is doing 5,000 different tasks at the same time. How important is for the computer to show that message or do something that our operating system, system is doing or connect to internet, receive that packet? So there are many things happening at the same time, okay? It's not, we don't feel it because all these things happen in milliseconds. So, say you want to create a progress indicator. Indica <laughs> you want to create a progress indicator, the one that shows 10% is done, 20% is done. It, it's a message that gets printed in a loop, correct? Okay. So, if we do that, if we actually start printing the message over there, and while the message is getting printed, another process is happening down there. Compiler decides if that process is more important or printing the thing that you have on a screen. Because printing a message on a screen is not a simple task, people. When you are having a loop, the loop is happening within your executable. You're adding to a variable. You're doing something, doing some process over there. It's maybe some difficult process. You are finding that answer to life, whatever. You're doing it over there. It's a very hard process that is going through. And the printout that you are doing, your program must exit from its executable, talk to a peripheral, send the information to the peripheral. That gives it to another one. It sends to a network thing. Network sends it throughout the internet. From internet comes over here to your SSH client and displayed to you. That's a huge process. And the compiler says, and the system says, hey, I'm doing this loop. That process of yours takes five million loops. If I show it every single time, it's going to run five million times low, slower because it's a bottleneck. It, I have to wait for that. Because of that, it prefers to do this and sh show that when it's done. Why? because you didn't use NL and use backslash N. Backslash N says, I am not prioritized. If you have something more important, do it. Don't send it to the output yet. It has it in its queue. They're all waiting. It's eventually going to go on the output. Okay? When you put NL, you're saying, stop that 5 million things. I don't care. I want it to get printed now. When you are using C in, because you're involved with console, the system flushes the output. <laughs> when you're using C in, you don't need to use it. Because C in, because C in is waiting for entry, right? So essentially, it's going to the console device. Therefore, the output is flushed. But if in any case you see it's waiting for you to, to get the data and prompt for the, for the user didn't come, then use the end. <laughs> yeah. But that, I don't think, is going to happen. OK? What do I want to do? What do I want to do? OK, I wanted to see. I'm just looking at what we have in here. What are we teaching today? We are teaching, OK, that's good. So uh, we have to 315, right? 310. It's uh, 245. Uh, I'll try to go through. I know I didn't give you a break. My apologies on that. Uh, if, you, if you allow me, I'll quickly go through something that I'm not supposed to even do. Uh, we are done for what we need. We talked about modules and everything. By the way, remember, I never cover everything. I talk about the most important stuff. And somebody sometimes asks a question, for example, namespaces. And because I'm teaching that, I'm not going to have time to finish everything. Therefore, you're responsible to go through 
all the stuff that we have and make sure that you understand it all and come to class and ask questions if it is not clear for you. Never ever I will cover everything that you have for that week and not always the thing that I say is actually in the notes. Many things that I say is completely out. It's not in the notes uh, because it just came up and I answered the question. For example, flushing the output. I don't know if, if, if it was mentioned over there or not. But okay. All right. So a flash forward. I'm going to show you a flash forward of what is about to come. Okay, so we talked about this subject thingy over here. We created a module for, so I'm going to remove all these garbage from here. I'm not going to delete them. They're still there. And I'm going to add the main for the subject. The, what do we call that thing? We said main is what? We said main is, the subject main is a unit test, okay? So, what do I have in the subject? So the subject that I have, I'm going to try to, so I'm going to say my abstraction of a subject, my abstraction of a subject is, my abstraction of a subject is, please don't speak, my abstraction of a subject is to write struct, subject, and let's say, that subject has a code. What else does it need? Uh, code and a semester that it's been offered in. So that's say, say that's my abstraction. Okay. Now, if I want to print that thing, what do I do? Because I'm a good person and I'm and I. Uh, modularize everything. I'm going to write all the functions that are related to that here. So in here, I'm going to create something like, uh, oh, we didn't talk about, do we need to talk about them? Give me a second. Read, we have these things over here. Please read it. I don't want to come over here and read over the notes. I hate it. Semantic errors, uh, things like that. <clears throat> Go through these things. Syntactic errors essentially means you have a syntax error. This one means logical error. Done. Okay. Go, I'll go, I'll go read it in detail because I'm going to ask you what is a semantic error. It was please go through. I'm not going to explain that. It's, it's very it's simple and straightforward. So you, you go through them, and it tells you that you have to debug it to find out how how things work, which is fine. Now, um, so what do I do? I want to actually uh, read a subject, okay? So what do I do? I'm going to say void, read, and I'm going to pass a subject pointer to it, right? Subject pointer, oh, pointer, sorry, pointer, SPTR, and that's what it's going to be. I want to print a subject. So what do I do? I'm going to say void, print, uh, subject, because I know I, I'm supposed to pass it by address to save time, I'm going to write a constant subject pointer. I'm trying to be, remember that, right? You don't pass structures by value, they are expensive. You have to pass, if I pass, <clears throat> if I pass as the subject by value, I have two integers passing. That's eight bytes. When I pass the address, it's only one integer. That's four bytes, so it's much cheaper. Okay? What, when I say cheap and expensive, what does it mean? Processing time, memory. Okay? So, so I do that. Let's say I want to set a subject. I'll go void set. So I'm going to set a subject. That's a subject SPTR. And in here, I'm going to have an int code and uh, int semester. Okay? Are you okay with this? Now I want to write the code. Because I'm lazy, I'm just going to bring the mouse, go over here, and I'm going to say, 
create definition in subject.cpp, poof, it comes over, <laughs> creates it for me so I don't have to do it. So it actually creates it over there for me. That's one of the good things about IDEs. So that's the subject, then I'm going to come over here, same thing for the print, and same thing for the set. Okay? So I have the three over there. Are we okay with this? Now I want to read the subject. What do I do? First of all, in here, I'm going to say read the subject, so I'm going to say see out. Okay, so I did see out. I'll bring it over here. Extremely important. Never include in a header file unless you have to. Using, you never do. Have to, shmaf to. But including a header file, only include your header files where they are used. Remember that. Okay? So I'm doing a see out. I'm going to say include. Actually, I'm not going to write the read. I'm going to make it even smaller. I'm just going to write a print and a, and, a, and a set because I just want to give you the example. Let's not babble too much. So I'm going to remove the read. I'm just going to have a set and a print. So print prints it. So in here, I'm going to say uh, uh, include. So include IO stream using namespace. STD. All right. So in here, I'm going to say C out uh, SPTRs uh, code, right? M code. And that's one of the good things. When you write M, all the, all the member variables are listed in front of them. So it makes your life easy. M code. And that works in uh, some text editors too, like, uh, uh, like Visual Studio Code or um, uh, Notepad++ plus plus and things like that, okay? So in here, I'm going to do like that, and I'm going to put a column, and in here, I'm going to say semester, and in here, I'm going to put SPTR, M semester, SPTR, and I'll go to new line. And to set them, I simply say SPTR, M code is set to code, and uh, SPTR semester is set to semester. Are we okay with this? Right? So now I wrote a modular thing. Are we okay with this? Well, this is not object oriented. Remember, I told you we don't have standalone functions. What C++ does, it brings the action that belongs to a subject inside the subject. So instead of having something like this, it brings it inside the, the subject. Now that it is inside the subject, does, do I need to pass a pointer of a subject to it? No. It is inside the subject. If I have a headache, I know what it hurts. It's part of my body. Right? So when I say print, print, as you see, like a global variable that you write in C, it has global. All the functions inside the, inside the subject have access to those. I don't need to pass anything to it. It knows what to print. For read, do I need to pass a subject to set? No. It knows which subject is setting. It just needs the values. So that will be removed. Now I'm going to recreate these. As you see, now I have to use a scope resolution to say print belongs to subject. It's not a standalone function anymore. This is now called a method. So now in here, instead of writing this, I can directly access M code and SPTR and semester without any access because print is part of subject. It has access to all its properties. 
And it's the exact same thing for the subject. If I come over for the set, if I come to set, I can actually use the exact same code and <coughs> do this. So I don't have to have that garbage anymore. Okay? So these become obs obsolete. Now, question comes up, how do you do this then? In here, you guaranteed, because you are printing the subject, you're not going to change the code, right? How do you do that over here? Print is part of subject. It can change code. How can I make print incapable of changing its owner? How can I do that? That's very simple. All you need to do is to say, hey, subject, this print is const to you, which means print cannot change its owner. Set can. Set's job is to set. And in here, I'm going to come and call this one const. So I accomplished encapsulation, putting the data and behavior together. And therefore, in my main, I can actually create a subject. S. Now I can say S dot set to one to two four four and semester two and S dot print. Subject S print yourself. Now I can have another subject. Set one four four semester one and S dot print. When I say T, oh, when I run this program, obviously, when the program's running, when the two objects are created, as you see, garbage and garbage. Okay? It comes in, when I say set, it goes to set of S. So it goes in there, and now the code is 244 and semester. When it comes out, you'll see that now S is set, but T remains garbage. And when I print it, it prints the S. And the same thing over here. Now I say t.set, it goes to t and sets the t with the exact same logic. And now, therefore, t is now at 144. And that's that. Putting the data and behavior together. No syntax is still C, believe me. You just have to reorganize. We are just teaching you how to organize your thoughts and make your program, your application, Act like what happens in real world. You say, fart out, teach. I'm going to teach OOP244. Where is the name of the teacher that teaches something else? She tell me something. You have another teacher? No, for whatever. Give me a teacher for some. Huh? David, what does he teach? Web. Humphrey? Wow, you're lucky. He is an amazing teacher. He is like, oh my God. So if you say, David, teach, web is going to be taught. You say, Fardad, teach, OP244, C++ will be taught. Exactly that. Each object has the method that it belongs to. I have a method of teaching because I'm a teacher. David has a method of teaching because he's a teacher. You tell him to teach. Is going to teach what is it's his property. You tell me teach, I'm going to do what is in my property. Therefore, object orientation. Are we good? That was a preview of what's to come. Questions? Suggestions? What, 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 what? Anything I do in here will go on GitHub. No exception. The reason that I didn't do it before, because I had to do lots of stuff with other faculty, so I was busy. But uh, as soon as I get home, actually, let me do it now. So save.
So let me just do it now. So OP244 notes. There are some problems with it. I made some mistakes that I have to fix later. But I right click over here, commit. Then I'll go add all. Then I'm going to say uh, week one. Commit and push. Everything, including all the namespaces, are gone. OK? Now you have access to all of them. All right? I will post the videos later. I have to upload it to YouTube. It takes time. OK? Questions? Suggestions? Objections? Any question one? Any question two? Sold. Say hello to David for me. <laughs>